Gary. Lorraine. Hello, Steve. How's it going? How you like your new hours? <laughs> I'm obsessed. He was. He was looking right directly at me. Good morning. Thank you for being here. We're going to start in just a second. I see Barry's rounding up some people, including Eric. <laughs> okay. This week, we're singing Christmas carols, and I picked all Christmas carols that focus on the location or the condition that Jesus was born to. Okay, so we know he was born in Bethlehem. We know that. It says so quite plainly. And Bethlehem was where David was born, where David was selected as well to be the king. Bethlehem means the house of bread, and Jesus became known to be the bread of life. Did you know that the weather in Bethlehem this time of year is almost the same as the weather here right now? So the average temperature for December in Bethlehem is a low of 47 and a high of 56. And yesterday in Pleasant Hill, the low was 46 and the high was 57, so within one degree. So... How would you like to slept in a barn last night with no high-tech clothing, just straw and some hand-woven cloth to keep you warm? And the barn was probably made out of rocks, maybe kind of carved into a hill, more like a cave. And you had beast of burden and animals all around and only prickly straw uh, for insulation. I don't think that would be a great way. I know when I came out this morning, it was kind of chilly. So I can't imagine, and I, I want to spend one minute saying uh, my daughter had her third son on Tuesday. So Susan and I have been up there all week taking care of the older boys. And uh, I couldn't help but think, wow, what did Mary think? You know, um, But I wouldn't want to have a baby out last night in a cold barn. So would you stand? We're going to open with a little town of Bethlehem. Bye. 
how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to humble heart the blessings of the seven. No ear may hear the coming and in this world of sin. Their meek souls will receive him still. The dear Christ enters in. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Thou come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Oh, come to So this is traditionally the second Sunday of Advent, uh, if you're familiar with that tradition. And the second Sunday is, uh, recognizes the joy and hope of the coming Jesus. And the candle that's normally lit is uh, referred to as the Bethlehem candle. Didn't know if you knew that. Okay, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning where we focus on, on you, that you were willing to leave your heavenly throne to lie in a manger of straw, to leave the comfort and the setting of just absolute praise and worship for you. You created the stars, and then you chose to come lie under them. You created the earth, and then you came to the earth to lie under those stars in such poor conditions, Lord, because you loved us so much. As we sing these songs, Lord, these traditional songs, it's easy to just sing, they're so familiar, but Lord, help us to remember that every word is written with a heart for you and celebration and joy and anticipation of your coming to the earth. Be with us, Lord, as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
as we prepare for communion. We're going to prepare with what child is this? And it, it asks the question is, who is it that lies in such mean a state, such a tough place? Well, Luke tells us clearly in Luke 2.11, for today in the city of David where has been born for you a Savior who is the Christ the Lord. And who is it that the angels proclaim? Luke goes on in two. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were ter terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, Do not be frightened, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there was born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. What child is this to lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet within the sleep as shepherds watch for keeping. Matthew 2, 9 through 12. 
after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they worshipped him. They presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. For hundreds of years, the rulers of Babylon, a city about 500 miles east-northeast of Jerusalem, appointed wise men called Magi to be their advisors. They held various government positions and taught in the finest schools. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, we learn that during the exile of the Jewish people from Judea into Babylon from 597 BC to 538 BC, Daniel was appointed chief magi. After the end of the exile, and the Jewish return to Judea, Daniel chose to remain in Babylon as chief magi. In the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, he foretold the exact year that God would send the Messiah to Israel. It was probably that prophecy that triggered the visit of the Magi hundreds of years later that we read about in Matthew. In celebration of the first or second Christmas, they honored the birth of the Messiah, or King of the Jews, with three gifts that held deep symbolic meaning. Each gift was expensive and rare. They were commonly given to kings or given as burned offerings at the temple of one of the many ancient gods of the ancient world. The gifts of the Magi point to the first and greatest Christmas gift of all, the gift of God's Son to mankind. Each gift illuminates a different aspect of Christ's identity and purpose. Gold was a symbol of kingship and authority. Jesus was born of the line of King David and was rightful king of the Jews. As the Messiah, he is God's anointed to reign forever and ever as king of kings and lord of lords over all creation. Frankincense, an expensive spice, was of what was often burned as incense in the temples of the ancient world. In Leviticus 2.2, we find it was burned in the tabernacle of God and later in the temple at Jerusalem 
as part of a burnt offering to God. It points to the deity of Christ and the offering of himself on our behalf. Myrrh, a bitter and expensive spice, was used in burial preparation to symbolize the bitterness of death. In John 19, 38 through 40, Nicodemus brought myrrh to the burial of Jesus. It would have been used as a layer between the strips of cloth wrapping the body of Jesus and as a burial anointment applied to the body itself. This gift from the Magi proclaims the death and burial of the Messiah, similar to the proclamation we make when we come to the Lord's table. The Magi are looking ahead while we are looking behind. Join me in prayer as we prepare to make our proclamation this morning. Father God, thank you for the sign of the Magi who so clearly point to your Christ, your Messiah. Help us to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns, as your word instructs us to do in 1 Corinthians 11.26, by eating the bread and drinking the cup. Most of all, thank you for the gift of yourself so that we might have forgiveness for sin and eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Partake with me of the bread of life. Drink with me. Burning incense, we're going to talk about that today. We meet Mr. Zacharias, John the Baptist daddy. Good morning, church. Good to be with you again this morning. We've been, well, it's not like we've been doing it a long time. Last week, we've, we, we talked about Mary, the mother of God. How do you feel about that phrase? Theotokos, the mother of God. Does it make you squirm a little bit? Yeah? Yeah, I remember saying Hail Mary. yeah. Well, it's been um, in both Rome and in the West and in the East, the Orthodox Church, it's accepted doctrine. If we believe that Jesus was fully God, in the flesh, then Mary was his mother. Now, we certainly don't believe that Jesus began to exist in her womb. We know that's false. Jesus has always been because Jesus is God. He has no beginning or end. But if we insist that they had a big argument about it, and I should have studied more since I brought it up, the council in which they decided if that was a, a um, legitimate, doctrinally sound term, and it was, Theotokos, the mother of God, as long as we unpack it, right? Holy Mary, right? Mother of God, 
that. Well, well, you're just quoting Luke when you do the Hail Mary until you get to the part about praying for us sinners, right? Um, we, I, it's funny you mentioned that. My mom's funeral was yesterday. And we talked about the Hail Mary because she was raised Catholic. And she knew that she knew the Hail Mary. Um, what is it? It's Holy Mary. Hail Mary. Full of grace, right? We quote the words of Gabriel. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Yeah, we can stop there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the first three hundred years. Yeah. On him? It wasn't until about 400 years in the church history that they started to put the soldiers on Mary. Right. The first 300 years, it was intended only to elevate God. Right, as fully God, as it should. Yeah. It's still mind blowing. Gosh, it's, we were singing those great hymns this morning, I was thinking about that. The angels, it blew the angels' mind, you know? <laughs> um, that God in the flesh would, would appear that way, would come that way, lowly. And um, I'm not sure I buy the line that no crying he made. <laughs> he would be the only baby in the history of the world. And, but it's probably pretty irrelevant. That's the thing that makes Jesus so amazing is that he allowed himself to experience all of these things that human beings experience. Hunger, thirst. How does God, the creator of the world, hunger or get thirsty, you know, or learn his... Can you imagine Mary teaching Jesus how to walk, you know? The creator of the world in human form teaching him how to walk. It's just like... Anyways, we could talk about this all day. I love it. I love, I love talks like that. Just pondering the incredible magnificence and unbelievable and indescribable magnificence of Jesus is always a good thing. I'm glad we're a church that makes much of Jesus. May we always be a church that magnifies the name of Jesus, God with us. Yeah. Because once you lose that, well, then you might as well lock the doors. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, you are magnificent and incredible and, and mind-blowing. And we just praise you and thank you that you did. You actually became one of us. You got down here with us in the dirt, in the muck, in the mire with lowly people who needed a Savior, who needed a Messiah, and that's what the angels declared. That's what Gabriel kept telling people. The Messiah is coming. You will find him wrapped in clothes and lying in a feeding trough. What? We just praise you, God, that we worship a, a God who knows what it's like to be us, who knows what it's like to suffer and to die and to conquer death for us. So that we may have life and life more abundantly. There are no words to give you adequate praise. No words, God. And we will spend eternity in your presence praising you. Whatever we do when we get to quote unquote heaven. It will involve being with you and praising you. And we just thank you this morning. And, and, and proclaim your name, Jesus. Jesus that you were and are Messiah, and you have saved your people. Amen. Man, I just, we can just keep singing and praising. We don't need a sermon. Hmm. Yeah, he's, he's, he's good. Whose God is like our God? No. So, yes, so, so yes, where was I? Zacharias. We meet Zacharias this morning. Zacharias, Luke actually starts his book talking about Zacharias, not Mary. We kind of snuck in last week 
in the middle of the beginning. When we talked about Gabriel's visit to Mary from Nazareth, um, he had a meeting with a guy before Mary, didn't he? His name was Zacharias, and he would be John the Baptist's father. And Zacharias was what, John? He was a priest. And when the angel of the Lord, well, I got to be careful. Was it an angel of the Lord, not the angel of the Lord? Right, Barry? There's a difference. Yeah. <laughs> it was an angel of the Lord, Gabriel, who met him in the temple while he was what, John? Lighting incense. Yeah, that's where Gabriel met him. While he had, been, he had been selected by lot, by chance, right? We know that nothing ever happens completely by chance. God had a divine appointment with, with Zacharias that day. And so he decided that by lot, Zacharias would be chosen to go in and perform this priestly duty. So, yes, um, our doubts, how about this? I, I, you know, I struggle. I told John when I first met him that I hate sermon titles because I'm bad at them, just horrible at them. Our doubts don't discourage our dad, our heavenly dad, our heavenly father. Isn't it good to know that your doubts and your frailty and your weakness and your insecurities and your incompleteness and your failings do not disappoint your heavenly father? Isn't that good? Because they disappoint me, an earthly father, all of those things about my son Jackson, I could stand up here and tell you, oh, they don't ever bother me. I'm so not the gospel to my kid. I've said this to you before, right? The feeling, so often my feelings regarding my son is based on his behavior. Right? I like him more when he's better. Isn't it good that God isn't like that? And if we're not careful, we begin, to, we begin to shape our theology that way. Well, if I go to church and I go to Bible study and I get up in the mornings and I pray and I do-do-da-da-da, God's going to like me more. And then something bad happens and you go, well, wait a second. I've been doing all, I've been checking off my list. How could this happen? Aren't you pleased with my effort? We realize we're going to get into that a little bit today. Your effort doesn't have anything to do with it. God loves you, period. Mic drop. Right? It's not Santa Claus. You know, Santa Claus is so not the gospel. He's not checking his list to see who's naughty or nice. It's so not gospel. And I'm not bashing Santa Claus. We, we do Santa Claus. I'm not trying to get all fundamentalist on you. It's up to you whether you do so. I'm just saying Santa Claus is not gospel. Right? <laughs> your behavior, <laughs> your behavior, your, your, the gifts God gives us, the blessings he, he, he bestows on us, the love he showers us with is not dependent on your behavior. Now, consequences are dependent on our behavior. And those are oftentimes unpleasant. I guess you could call that the coal in the stocking. But God is not, you know zapping us with the, I used to think that I used to think of God kind of in heaven or on that throne with the big white beard and he had a lightning bolt in his hand and whenever I would mess up he'd like <laughs> jacked up theology anyways I digress Zacharias Luke 1 beginning in verse 5 we've, we've been talking about people's response to Good news. And, and, and oftentimes, just like us, people respond differently in different contexts, sometimes well, like Mary. I think we'd all, you know, if we had done what Mary did, we'd be pretty proud of ourselves. Mary, man, was given some unbelievable, incredible, ridiculously hard to believe news, and she trusted, didn't she? She said, well, if you said it, so be it. Whew. And the rest is history. We're going to meet a guy today, maybe more like me, perhaps more like you, who's more like, well, um, I'm going to need a deposit, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm going to have to see something before I can believe it. Maybe more like Thomas. 
uh, Zacharias. Let's just jump into the text. And yes, there it is. You guys are so good in the back there, keeping track of the text in my rabbit trail travels. In the days of Herod, Luke writes, king of Judea, there was a priest, and his name was Zacharias, and he was the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name, we met her last week, was Elizabeth, right? We know that she was Mary's cousin, and they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I thought that was interesting that Luke called them righteous and that they were walking blamelessly. Now, we know they could not have been perfect. There was only one man who was ever perfect. His name was Jesus, of course. And yet there seems to be an indication here that God considered them righteous because of their behavior. That's, I probably shouldn't even have gone there because that makes one ponder. The Old Testament, sometimes we see people described that way. They were righteous. They were law keepers. And so we see that even though they were not perfect and even though they did not keep the law perfectly, they were God followers. They were God lovers. They, 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 they understood the importance of the law and of worshiping and praising God in and through their actions. You know, I need to be careful when I talk about Jesus not being Santa Claus and not blessing us or cursing us, depending on our behavior, that's certainly true, but that does not mean that our actions don't have consequences, right? If you love me, Jesus says, you'll obey my commandments. It'll be good for you. And so behavior is important. I just think the motivation, we have to be careful when we describe the motivation. We obey and we follow Christ because of the love he's shown us and our love for him, not because we're trying to earn brownie points. There's a difference. But behavior, by all means, we're encouraged to live rightly. Absolutely. I don't ever want to go too far over in the lane, right? You're always bouncing off one guardrail, and maybe you go over and you get too close to the other one. We have to be careful and not, in the, when we talk about grace, that we don't leave out the importance of our behavior. We want to be godly in the spirit and produce fruit. That's why God has changed us and rescued us. So behavior certainly is important. So they were both righteous, Luke says, in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But, but, and I think we're, it's safe to assume here, that something they wanted, something they desired, something they had been praying for, something that they really, really well desired was absent. But they had no child. We've seen this before in Scripture, haven't we? It's a heavy, heavy burden on people in the Bible and on some of, I'm sure we've made perhaps even you here today have struggled with that, not having a child. If, if, if it isn't you personally, you've certainly known a couple, a woman, a, a, a family who's, who's really wanted children and hasn't been able to have them. It can be devastating, hard, hard on, on people um, watching, especially around the holidays when you, kids are such a big focus of the holidays and, and, and you, you see a couple that really wants a child and for whatever reason has been unable to have one. It's heartbreaking. And, and we see that Zacharias and Elizabeth were there and they were older and they had had no children. They had had no children. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. So not only had they no, had no child, they weren't going to have kids, were they? They both had probably come to the realization and to the conclusion that this was something they were never going to be blessed with. They were too old at this point. They were too old. Now, it happened that while he was performing his priestly service, did I skip some? No, I didn't skip some verses yet. No. No. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God 
in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the office, he's doing his job as a priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias, like Mary a little bit later, was troubled when he saw the angel. Something about, again, Luke doesn't really tell us how, something about Gabriel probably was supernatural in appearance. And Zacharias realized he wasn't just in the presence of another person, of another human that had somehow snuck into the temple. There was something unique about Gabriel, something magnificent about this angel that scared Zacharias when he saw him. And fear gripped him, Luke says. But the angel said to him, it won't be the first time Gabriel has to say this, will it be? Um, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition, your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will give him the name John. Your prayer has been heard. Now, If he had just, Gabriel had just stopped there. Your prayer has been heard. Don't be afraid, Zacharias. Your prayer has been heard. What might Zacharias have been thinking? Probably what he'd been praying about most recently. Probably not, again, all speculation, right? Probably not the prayer that he had probably stopped praying a long time ago about having a child. But Gabriel goes on to say, your prayer has been heard. Your wife is going to be pregnant and you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John. Don't ever think that because you're being asked or, or, or you're just waiting for a response to your prayer that it hasn't been heard. Don't ever think, well, God must have been off that day. Right? It got lost in the mail. Uh, um, um, uh, it's just lingering out there in the atmosphere. No, God answers your prayers. It's just that, darn it, we don't always get the answer right then. Man. And that encourages me. That encourages me. And it irritates me because like a little child at Christmas, why can't I open it now? Why must I wait? Well, we know, right? This is a sermon in and of itself. There's things to learn in the waiting. Wait on the Lord. We read the Psalms over and over again. It's a constant theme. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait. Wait on the Lord. There's blessing in the waiting. Stuff is happening to us in the waiting. We're being changed. We're being transformed. We're being taught things like we're being pruned, aren't we? Taught things like patience. And long, you know, well, long suffering is just another, it's a King James word for patience. Patience. You know, why can't I think of anything else right now besides patience? Because that's such the, that's one of the biggest things. Patience, trust, faith, hope. All of these things, these fruits of the spirit that God intends to water in us and to grow in us come from waiting. Come from waiting. He's not mad. We talk about this a lot. He's not mad at you if you're waiting for an answer for prayer. He's not mad at you. He's not toying with you like a little kid does with the magnifying glass and the ants, right? He's not punishing you or torturing you. He doesn't enjoy watching a squirm. that's That's not his purpose at all. His purpose is always good for us. It's always good for us. Zacharias, I'm assuming, and Elizabeth have probably stopped praying for a child at this point, right? At a certain age. I'm not sure how old they were, but they were obviously past childbearing years. 
And I would assume they had stopped praying for this child. And yet, guess what? Gabriel comes and says, hey, God heard your prayer. God heard your prayer. Now he's ready to show you the answer. The answer he gave you a long time ago. When you prayed for a child, Gabriel might have gone on if he was there to preach a sermon. God said yes. God said yes. The very first time you prayed for a child, God said yes. It's just going to come much, much later down the road. Don't think that because you haven't seen an answer to your prayer that God hasn't answered it. Don't think that. Verse 14. So this is wonderful news, isn't it? Your prayer has been heard. God said yes. Your wife's going to be pregnant, and you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him John. Your last, by the way, his last name wasn't The Baptist. I went to, this is a true story, I went to this old school Baptist church in Alabama once when I was in grad school, way back in the hills. I mean, this church was Baptist, Baptist. I was almost surprised they didn't have snakes. But they didn't. They weren't Pentecostal Baptists. They were Baptist Baptists. But the guy got up, I can't remember, he, was pre he wasn't preaching this text. He was preaching the text when Jesus got baptized. And he said, serious, serious as a heart attack. I almost laughed, but I had to catch myself. I was in the back. He said, you know what the best thing about John's name was? His last name. The Baptist. Yeah. I'm like, mm, I think that was his last name. Best thing about his name was his last name. Not his last name, but wonderful, wonderful news Gabriel has for Zacharias. All these things are going to happen. All these things are going to happen. In verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Remember, he does this for Mary a little bit later, right? He kind of goes, he gives this resume, this commercial for, for, for what your son is going to accomplish in and through the power of the spirit. Oh, my goodness. Listen to this. He's going to have, you are going to have joy and gladness. And may, not just you, many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. But he's not going to drink any wine or liquor. He will be filled. I'll tell you what that probably means in a minute. And he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even while he's in his mother's tummy. While he is yet in the womb, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he is going to turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. That was John's purpose, was to prepare a way, right, for the Messiah. He was baptizing people, what? For the forgiveness of their sins, to turn them back to God, to their eyes toward God for his redemption, for his rescue. This is what John is going to do. It is he, Gabriel goes on in verse 17, who will go as a forerunner before him, that is the Messiah, before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he quotes Malachi to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is what your son will do, Zacharias. He is going to fulfill the prophecy of Malachi. He will be that Elijah figure that will herald the coming Messiah. Wow. It appears that John is going to be a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite, by the way, could also be a female, was an Israelite who wanted to take special vows in order to serve the Lord, not a priest. I was trying to think of an equivalent in our current day context, and I really couldn't think of one. But a person who desired to be a Nazarite would take a Nazarite oath. They would not cut their hair. They would drink no alcoholic beverages, huh? Yeah. Right? Samson was a Nazarite. So was Samuel, remember? Samson and Samuel, what was special about their mamas? Do you remember? They were both barren. God bless a man. There's, there's a connection there, obvious connection. I'm not sure what it might be. I wouldn't be sure how to preach it. But right, Samson's mom, Samuel's mom, John the Baptist's mom, 
All Nazarites, all barren until much later in life when God chose to bless them with children. But yes, you would take a Nazarite vow and it, it would be a special vow in which you would, well, vow not to do certain things, to do certain things in the honor, in the, in the, in the, in the privilege, the calling and privilege of worshiping the Lord in your life. You would be a role model, so to speak, for the people. Wasn't sure. I should probably should have done some more research. I would be interested to know what the difference was between a Nazarite person and a priest. There might have been some similarities. But you didn't have to be. You could be a Nazarite and not be a priest. It appears, and we're not told in the text that that's what John the Baptist is, but it's very similar to the vows that a Nazarite would take. Gabriel says he's not going to do these things. He's not going to drink alcoholic beverages, etc., etc. And Gabriel says that John will be the Elijah figure, like I said, spoken of in Malachi, that will herald the coming Messiah. This is huge. This is big. And so, Zacharias says in verse 18... How will I know this for certain? Hmm. How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Now, much like Mary, right? <laughs> Gabriel tells Mary these incredible... Man, you think John the Baptist's resume is impressive. What about the one he gives Mary about her son? Who? It's even better, isn't it? And the first thing Mary says, well, let's go back to the beginning about being pregnant, right? How is that going to happen when I haven't been with anybody? Fair question. John, in, or John, Zacharias, in a similar way, says, let's go back to the beginning. We're going to have a son? How can this be? How am I going to know for sure when my wife and I are old my wife and i are advanced in years and the angel answered and said to him i am gabriel darn it i almost again i'm i almost imagine him saying do you know who you're talking to i have an inside line okay i uh, i i have an inside tract i know things you don't i'm gabriel I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Wow. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. I almost, now I'm choosing to read it this way. I have no idea if this is how Gabriel said it. But I choose to read it in my reading of the story. Like, Gabriel's a little offended. Like, like you know, I don't just have a run-of-the-mill resume here. I actually stand in the presence of God Almighty, and I've come to give you a message. This isn't just your postman, right, or some random neighbor, the UPS guy. I come from, a, I come from the man's office directly. I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you the good news, and behold, you're going to be silent and unable to speak. Until the day when these things take place, because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. And the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they were able to realize that he had seen a vision in the temple. Something happened in there. And he kept making signs to them. And remained mute. And when the days of his priestly service were ended, he didn't get to leave sick that day. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, did become pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Now, when you go back and you read Sam, Hannah's prayer, Samuel's mama's prayer, it's very, very similar. 
When God gives her, lets her see the answer to her prayer that she had been praying a very long time, right? About having a son. She prays in much the same way that Elizabeth does. You have shown me favor. You have given me what I asked for a long time ago. And she praises God for it. She acknowledges that he is the one who has done it for her. Very, very similar prayer. So, Zacharias basically asks the same question Mary does, but receives an altogether kind of different response, doesn't he? Mary asks, well, how can this be? John, or I keep calling him John. If I do this in the future and I don't catch myself, you know I mean Zacharias, right? Not John. Zacharias does it too. Zacharias basically asks the same question. How can this be? How will I know this for certain? But Gabriel takes his voice away. So what's the difference? We're not exactly sure. We're not told exactly, but I think we can get our answer in Gabriel's reply in verse 20. Is that still up there? Can you flick back? You're going to be silent. This is why Gabriel responds a different way, I think. And not able to speak until the day these things take, taste, take place because you did not believe me. Somehow, some way, Gabriel and God, right? God is not absent from this conversation, is he? He's not waiting for Gabriel to come back and say, okay, well, what did they say? <laughs> right? <laughs> God is in it. God is there. In Mary's response, it wasn't that she didn't believe Gabriel. It wasn't that she didn't believe God. She genuinely wanted to know, genuinely wanted to know, how is this going to happen? How am I going to have a son? It's not that I don't believe you. I believe you. How is this going to happen, though, if I haven't had relations with a man? Zacharias' response, as God would be able to see and know, obviously, he's God, he can. Zacharias' response comes from a place of disbelief. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. And if I were honest with you, you know me. I don't know you. I don't know what... I, 99 times out of 100, I'm probably going to respond like Zacharias. I wish, I'd hope that I could have the faith and trust that Mary does, but more than likely, I'm going to go, mm, I've been praying a long time, and you said no. Over and, well, and he might have said, well, how do you know I said no? Well, because you didn't give it to me. I, and I've told you that. I've actually said that to God. I've actually told him that if he were involved in a certain way then xyz would have happened i've actually had the nerve to tell god that with my voice because if you had been involved this would have happened or this would not have happened and god in his grace and mercy met me there and straightened me out there very lovingly and very graciously and very gently praise god but i've actually said that to him the nerve, right? Just now I'm thinking, wow, that's arrogant. It is, but I've said it. You may have been in a place where you've said it. God, if, if this were true, if you loved me, then this would happen. And because this hasn't happened, you obviously don't love me. And we call into question his character, don't we? We do. That's, that's what we do. We call into question his truth, his word. I don't really believe you. I don't really believe you. You say this, but this has happened or this hasn't happened. And in my mind, if this is true, then this has to follow. And this hasn't followed, therefore that's not true. Probably the only one that's done that. Zacharias does that. And Gabriel says, hmm, hmm. Well, well, maybe perhaps Zacharias even intimates in his words, I need to, like I said earlier, I need a deposit. I need something to tell me or to show me that you're not messing around with me. I need, I need something, perhaps maybe even a sign. I kept thinking of, was it King Hezekiah and Isaiah? Where, I, where Isaiah actually says, hey, God says you can ask him for a sign. Do you remember that? And he wouldn't. Right, right. And what does Isaiah say? Well, he's going to give you a sign anyway. 
Perhaps there's an intimation in, in Zacharias' uh, words that he wants, you know, show me something. I need more than you just telling me this is going to happen. And Gabriel says, well, okay. And by the way, Gabriel doesn't have magic powers. That can, Gabriel's not mad and, and it's going to zap Zachariah. Well, this is God's decision. This is God's decision. I don't know in some supernatural way. God says, whispers in Gabriel's ear, he wants a sign. Give him a sign. You have my, you have my authority to give him a sign. And he is speechless. He is speechless. He's rendered, he's literally rendered speechless. He cannot speak. Here's your sign. Shh. Hush. Hush. I was thinking about why that? Again, speculation. Have no clue. Your guess is as good as mine. Why that was the thing that was done to Zacharias. I was thinking maybe because he's a priest and a priest is supposed to proclaim God's truth and a priest is supposed to be the inter inter intermediary between the people and God and a priest is supposed to speak praise and worship and, and faith and trust. And obviously, Zacharias, you're not in a place right now where you can do that. So you're going to be quiet for a while. <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. Yes, that's yes. I love that. Yeah, let me, let me help you. How many times in our lives, I love having a discussion with you guys, I hope you don't mind, when God has, might have said to us and we thought, why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why did this occur? Maybe it's God's way of saying, let me help you. Right? You haven't, you're not listening to me. You're not trusting me. You're not, you, your eyes are on this and that and this. Let me help you. What was it? Oh, I always say, yeah, I was, because then you, then you might say, if you actually said that, you'd be like, no. Like my son will say, do I have to do this? For you? No, no. I always wonder if we might do that, right? No, 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 I got it. <laughs> Let me help you, Darren. No, 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 I got it. Okay, I listen. I'm listening. It's like, when I, it's like when Jesus, totally unrelated, when Jesus tells Peter to get out of the boat, I'd have been like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Is that you? I don't know. Is that you? Is that really you? That's really you. Tell me to get out of the boat and walk on the wall. Okay, come on, Darren. I'm, I'm good. Right? That's, that's all I needed to hear. I'm like, Peter, I, t I, I, I love Peter. The, uh, Peter frustrates me, but I still think it's awesome that he got out of the darn boat. I still can't believe he did that. Peter got out of the boat. That, that, and I know he didn't make it very far, and I know he, he lacked faith, and he looked at the boat. Peter got out of the boat, man. Good, good on you, Peter. Peter got out of the boat. Anyways, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're digressing. So he, he, he's, he's rendered speechless. But God does exactly what he said he would, right? And Elizabeth became pregnant, and just like Hannah, like I said, Samuel's mom, she realizes that God has shown her favor. After all. God has shown her favor. Hold on. Keep praying. We don't keep praying, by the way, and this is a good term and topic for a, a future time. We don't keep praying like that. We, we misinterpret the unrighteous judge parable that way. That God is saying to us, keep on praying. Come on, come on. I need one more. I need one more. Just one more. And then I'm going to give you what you want. That's not how it works. So when I say keep praying, you keep expressing to God what it is. That you desire what it is you'd like to see him do and trust that he'll straighten our prayers out I know that oftentimes my prayers are selfish I know that oftentimes I'm praying for something I think I need when it's really just something I want but I trust God to mold it and shape it and work it so that that, that he's in my prayers and a lot of times you know what I'll do what I've been doing lately I'll lay there on the couch and in, in my prayer time and I'll say Holy Spirit pray for me you know what I need. You know what I desire. Change my prayer and work my prayer so that it's what it ought to be. Keep praying. Keep praying. Not because you're going to finally, God's finally going to go, ah, okay, I'm going to give you what you, no, it's, it's not like that. But keep praying 
because we keep talking to our heavenly daddy and trusting that he's going to work it out. Finally, I've been, been, been going on too long, you guys. I'm sorry. Verse 57, because we, we got the best part yet. We're going to jump ahead because this is where we take a break. We go meet Gabriel and Mary, and we come back to verse 57, and Luke says this. Now, the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son, just like Gabriel said, just like God said. And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her. How would they have heard that? She would have been telling them that. Um, um, Yes, they heard that, and they were rejoicing with her. They were rejoicing with her that God had answered her prayer. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to call him Zacharias. Why wouldn't they? After his father. But his mother answered and said, no, indeed, his name is going to be John. And they said to her, you, that's ridiculous. How silly is that? That's my my paraphrase. There's no one among your relatives who's called by that name. Why would you name him John? And they made signs to his father. Hey, straighten your wife out. I don't know how they made signs to her. You would maybe, hey, your wife is, <laughs> right? She wants to name him John. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and he wrote as follows. His name is John. Listen to her. Listen to my wife. <laughs> you can't listen to me. Because I didn't listen, right? Listen to my wife. His name is going to be John, he writes on this tablet. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. He, he, good good on you, Zacharias. Praise you, Jesus. I've learned my, well, you didn't say Jesus yet. Well, he still was talking to Jesus, Yeah, now we're getting convoluted. Praise you, God. Praise you, Yahweh. I've learned my lesson. He praises him when his mouth is opened. Praises God, and fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all of the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly, certainly with him. Zacharias had no idea when his voice would return, by the way. He had no idea when his voice would return. Remember, Gabriel said it would when all these things have taken place. Not just John the Baptist's birth, but all these things that John would do. Gabriel simply says your voice will return when all these things have taken place. So Zacharias could not have known that as soon as the baby was born, his voice would return. In fact, it was eight days later, wasn't it? So maybe... Maybe Zacharias is thinking, like his prayer about having a son, this might be the way I go out. I might be deaf, or not deaf, but mute for a very, 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 very long time. But he has learned his lesson. We can see that in his response to the people. No, you listen to my wife. She's right. His name is going to be John, and God chooses at that moment to open up his throat again. God chooses to heal him, if you will. And he doesn't hesitate to back his wife and do what the Lord commanded. His voice is returned. There was acknowledgement in his actions, in other words, I think. A kind of, no, my wife is right, his name is John, and I never should have doubted to begin with, kind of declaration. I think in his response on the, I always see it as a chalkboard. It probably wasn't a chalkboard. Dry erase board. Yeah, my wife is right. And I never should have doubted to begin with. Kind of humility. You can see some humility in Zacharias finally. Never should have doubted to begin with. As you said, um, Barry, yeah, I need you to listen. You're going to be quiet while I teach you some lessons. And he, he, he learned them. He learned them. And then he, and he breaks, and we call this the Benedictus. We call Mary's prayer the Magnificat because she, what, magnifies the Lord. It's Latin. The Benedictus, uh, uh, Zacharias gives us the benediction, if you will, in his prayer and his prophecy. 
quickly, and I should have, should not, this because this should have been the focus of our talk today. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Redemption for his people, and he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. There's that servant language again. Redemption. Whenever we see the word redemption, what should we think of? Being set free. That word redemption always meant being set free from bondage, being released from slavery. And Zacharias says, this is how God is going to do it. He, is a, he will accomplish this for us. He's going to set us free. Now, the Israelites were waiting for the Messiah to set them free in a more figurative sense, in a more, I'm sorry, in a more literal sense. Under the reign of the Roman Empire, just like they had always found themselves under the thumb of some country, by and large, this is what the Messiah would do for them. We know now, as modern-day Christians, that it was a redemption for much bigger things than that, wasn't it? Being set free from the bondage of sin and death. But Zacharias proclaims, this is what God is going to do. He's going to set us free. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant that, that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, there's the redemption, might serve him without fear. What is our ultimate enemy? Our ultimate enemy, the scriptures tell us, especially in the New Testament, is death. Death. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that death is the final enemy. Our ultimate enemy, Zacharias, probably didn't realize this when he was praising God and quoting Old Testament scriptures about being set free from the enemy. We know that we have been set free from the enemy, sin and death. And why were we set free? We talked about this when I did that sermon on Ephesians about having authority, right, in the heavens. We were set free to do right, to serve, to be all that we were intended to be. We were set free that we might serve him without fear, to be his ambassadors, to be his little representatives in his creation. This is why we're set free from bondage to sin and death, so that we can be all that we can be. Army stole that. To be all that we can be. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, to be forgiven of your sin was to be set free from bondage because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. You remember when Jesus shows up in Nazareth that day and he gets up in church he gets up in the synagogue and he reads from the scroll. You remember what book it was from? Isaiah. Good, good. You know that most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament is Isaiah. Where did he read from? He read from Isaiah 9, didn't he? He read from Isaiah 9. And what part of Isaiah 9 did he read from? Let me jump ahead. The people who walk in darkness will see what? A great light. Those who live in a dark land. The light will shine on them. That's what Jesus said. That's what John was born to proclaim that this man, this coming Messiah, behold the Lamb of God who cometh, I always say it in the King James, to taketh away the sins of the world, right? A man whose sandals I am unfit to even untie. This is who John the Baptist will herald. This is the one who will come and set us free from the bondage to sin and death, our ultimate enemy, by being to us a great light that shines in the darkness. 
What can we learn today uh, quickly? Um, yeah, doubt leads to pain. When we doubt the Lord, and I'm not saying it's, it's, it's you know, that, that you can have perfect faith. I'm not sure you can have perfect faith. And I'm not sure that you can eliminate doubt completely. Just like the man in Mark 9 that says, I believe, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Um, but, but, but understand that doubt leads to pain. The more we doubt, the more turmoil we're going to find ourselves in, whatever it has to do with. The more I wonder, does God really love me? Does God really have my best interests at heart? Does God really want best for me? The more pain and turmoil and anxiety and frustration and irritation I'm going to live with. Just know that. Just know that. Doubt leads to pain. It always does. Bring that to him. God, you see me die. Lord, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Dad. He's not offended by that, right? He would say, insert your name here, just talk to me. Tell me what you're feeling. I, I don't really believe you. Thank you. That's what he would say for admitting that. It's not like I don't already know it. But thank you for being self-aware enough to tell me. I haven't stopped loving you because I know you doubt me. I'm going to meet you there in the doubt. Confess that. Bring that to him. And watch him work in it. And be present in it and, and, and draw you even closer. I know you wonder whether I love you. I know you've been waiting a while. But doubting me only leads to pain and frustration. Come, come, come to me. Bring it to me. And I'll meet you in that place. Secondly, but pain leads to rejoicing. Weeping may endure for the night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. My favorite psalm. I love that psalm. Psalm 30. Weeping may endure for the night. There's some waiting. Jeremiah in Lamentations 3 talks about that waiting. It's good for a man to wait while he's young. And a woman too. But joy comes in the morning. My caveat that I give every week, it may not be because you get exactly what you thought you did. But God always has our best interest at heart and will always give us what's best. May not be what we thought. May not be what we thought we wanted. But pain leads to rejoicing. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Look at, thirdly, God is a warrior for his people. Zacharias uses this warrior language, in, um, especially in verses 71 through 74. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy toward our fathers. To remember his promise the oath which he swore to Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the, from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. God fights for you. Jesus intercedes for you. That mind-blowing enough. Do you know that Jesus is praying for you? How does that work? But that's what the word tells us. He's interceding for us. He's rooting for you. Insert your name here. I know this is hard, but I am rooting for you. I'm praying for you. Trust me. Trust me in the trial. Trust me in the pain. Trust me in the suffering. I will not let you go. I fight for you. And finally, in the dark, look for light. Look for light. Look for light. Trust the light. Go to the light. Sounds like a, 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 a horror movie or something. Don't go to the light. No, go to the light. Go to the light. Look for the light. God will always show up. He's never said no to the prayer. He said no to some prayers, a lot of prayers. But God has never said no to the prayer, meet me in my darkness. Meet me in my pain. Meet me in my trial. I need to see light. He's never said no to that. He never will say no to that. He always meets us where we need him. He always meets us in the dark with his light. Always to stay close to us, to stay by us, even though I walk through the valley of what? The shadow of death, the dark. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's pray. God, bless these people, I pray. May we trust you like Zacharias did after you shut his mouth. May we trust you like Mary did. God, as you grow us and mold us in your image, praise you, Jesus, for coming and being with us, and tabernacling with us. In your name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Darren. Would you stand with me? We're going to close with the first Noel. The first Noel the angels did say was certain for shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night but was so deep. No be seated and I'm going to ask Barry to come forward. All right, there we go. I think I'm on, right? Yep. All right, a couple quick things I wanted to share. Um, um, it's the holiday season. Um, you guys ready for Christmas yet? Yeah, 
Nah, most people aren't. I'm not. So, <laughs> but we got a lot of kind of holiday-related activities going on. So, kind of do in reverse order. On Christmas Eve, for those of us that are in town, not everybody will be in town, but we're going to have not a 10 o'clock, Christmas Eve's on a Sunday, which is, you know, doesn't happen every year, but we're gonna, not going to have a 10 o'clock service, but we're going to have a joint service with Senti, our Spanish church that meets on in the Sunday afternoons, and we're going to have a 1 o'clock in the afternoon Christmas Eve service, joint service. There'll be pieces in Spanish, pieces in English. It'll be, it'll be a chance for us to fellowship and share together um, with our Senti, our brothers. And that, so just heads up, if you show up at 10, it's going to be kind of quiet here. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's okay. In that. um, and then just a general note for those that um, are, are part of this at First Christian, you notice that big uh, green sheet on the wall by the office. That's where people are putting Christmas cards. And so you can bring Christmas cards. You can save a whole bunch of stamps by bringing them here for people that are here. And then you also need to check the pockets. It's by last name. So if I'm looking for my Christmas cards, I'm just going to ask the name Swan. I'll be looking in the S pocket. So look by last name, but there'll be Christmas cards from you. I guarantee it. So check it before you leave. Um, and, that, and you can use that for giving Christmas cards out to other people in the church. So, And then last of all, but not least, today we're going to be doing a fun Christmas activity back in the, in the room off by the kitchen. Um, Robert and Jamie, and I think Wendy, you were involved in some of this, um, are going to be doing um, a, a gingerbread house building. Holly Jolly Gingerbread House Day. So if you are all invited to come share in that, we'll have a light lunch. I think we're doing pizza and some other snacks. And then we get to hang out together, build gingerbread houses, just have a great time fellowshipping, another way to draw us into the Christmas season and that. So again, anybody's invited, guests, um, you know, tenders, members, come and join us for that. Um, we'll have a lot of fun with that and that. So, so I'm going to pray for us, and then real quick, we're going to do our annual election, which I'm just going to hand out a few things, and that, and, and so it'll only take a couple of minutes, but let me pray for us, and then we do have our end of annual election, and so I'm going to hand you explain that in a second, but let me pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Christmas season, and as, as Pastor Darren shared, the, the joy of the coming Messiah for those people. Now for us, it's the joy of your Son that came. And it was, he came to be one of us and to share in our existence, our experience. And then he came to suffer and, and pay the price for our sins. Father, thank you for this Christmas season. We get to remember your great gift to us. Help us to never forget what you've given to us. So bless us, guide us in this day. Help us to celebrate Christmas well. And thank you for being here with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so real quick for voting.